Good afternoon, everybody. How can I do even better than Patrick to bring? But uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will try to do it in 15 minutes uh, because I think what I try to do is maybe it's good that I'm at the end of the of the lectures today because uh, we talked a lot, a lot on how to uh, we have to we have to protect biodiversity uh, for ourselves in, in, in the sense of the intrinsic values. But what is the shift into want to? If we all want to protect biodiversity, maybe that's a good story to, to, to talk to tell about. So my story will be a little bit on, of course, European Federation, then go into my uh, specific area of work uh, in, in the northeastern of Belgium, where I manage a national park. But it's more like telling the story about how to go from have to to want to. Of course, if you look to this picture, and I'm a storyteller, then you see that this isn't the habitat of a tree frog. So this is just a table with a glass, and we are not living uh, in, in a world where a tree frog has that much space anymore. Or you could ask your question, where are the seals going to in so many uh, uh, shores and so many sea coastal areas across the world? Where are they going to? Well, there's a new species in town. And it's called also Homo sapiens, so maybe we are a species too, as we all know we are a mammal. And maybe that's good, but is it that, that good? Because we know when we are overloading our ships, and we keep on doing that, what I think the world is doing nowadays, we know what will happen in the end. We will <laughs> fail, and, and we will stop going forward. So are there questions to, all, to ask yourself? And, ourselves and where are we going to? This is a nice cartoon, I think. We've come from the sea and now we are polluting the seas across the globe. And <coughs> is this the right way to go? And are there solutions to find? And we know we still have just one globe, one Earth to work with. So it's the most beautiful place we can have, and I think. So we have to use all our brains together and think about how we can find some solutions to make this world more sustainable. So we have to rethink, and you see, reduce, reuse, recycle this uh, resource. We have to rethink the planet. Well, maybe this is, this is from a, a protest march in the United States. We can start with to kill ourselves because you know a lot of uh, scientists come to the conclusion that overpopulation is may, maybe the most important problem we have in the long term, and also Patrick to bring to, uh, to all this out. And uh, just referring back that we're all just mammals, and maybe it's good that we're all just mammals, and we have not lose all our instincts, maybe we have to trust on what we have, and maybe we can make the big decisions for it. This is not telling anything. It's also due to the. But what this was all about was that Europe, European Union did, did research on uh, what was the importance of biodiversity across the 27 uh, member states. And you see, the answer there was that the, all the citizens, of, citizens of the 27 member states, they see that biodiversity is one of the most serious problems we have. But if you compare that to the most important issues overall in Europe, you see, you, you could have seen, it wasn't on the screen, but that the environment is at the fourth last place. So we have to mind the gap, because there's a big gap between what we want as environmentalists and people who are working on protected areas, and what people, citizens in Europe think, and also politicians think. So we are trying to, uh, to, to bridge that gap into something which uh, can come to sustainable solutions. And I think there are a lot of things to do uh, that can be really successful. Also, it was mentioned, we have the United Nations, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, where I was too, and for a lot of people it was uh, not a good uh, result uh, there, but at the end there were some good, I think, expectations and also some goals now there where we can work with. This is often the answer I get when I talk to politicians or CEOs uh, across Europe, that it's too difficult, it's too complex to work with biodiversity and climate change and whatever ecosystems. <coughs> uh, so we have to find simple stories that people can understand and can adapt to and then hopefully raise enough awareness so that they, that they want to work along with that. So we know all about this. This is about sustainability. 
And often I say sustainability is a little bit like teenage sex as a container, as a buzzword. A lot of teenagers are talking about it. Just a few of them are doing it. And those who are doing it are doing it very badly. So is there something to find which includes pleasure within sustainability? Is this possible? Patrick and Brink uh, already told us about and also the former speakers on, on the ecosystem services, the TEEP reports were mentioned, and we are now talking about business and biodiversity across the globe, so it's maybe a good thing to start up with. So we have to find, really we have to find new solutions. And what can the, all those solutions be? Is there a possibility that economy and ecology can come together and uh, uh, hopefully green growth or green economy is not another buzzword. A lot of new things are found uh, related to biodiversity, uh, architectural things, <coughs> I don't, don't go into depth with that, but there are a lot of things now that are based on biodiversity and uh, direct us into a new uh, kind of thinking, which is good. This is coming from the university in Canada, They're thinking that we are really going to make a big shift here, but just what we see is from the trend watches over, over, over the, the world, the trend watches, yeah. they say something interesting. Now this is the value of latte. If you can <coughs> make your projects where you're all working on local, authentic, traceable, transparency and ethical, you are successful in the future and a lot of protected areas and biodiversity multiples I think are very latte proof. And you have to know that the first national park on, on the world, uh, Yellowstone Park, and uh, there has an, uh, a statue over there where it's uh, stated for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people. And I think that's important to tell you about because these horses, for instance, they don't know how valuable they are. They are just jumping and crossing through the, the pastures and so on and so forth. But if people understand, if people would like to say these mammals are valuable, then maybe we can make a big shift across a, crew, a, crew, a new world, a new sustainable world. On green growth, because we are thinking about green growth today, I think it must deliver a fundamental contribution to solve major environmental problems such as climate change and biodiversity, and then, and should also be evaluated on these environmental criteria, because I think that's a big issue for the next coming period that we have to evaluate on that. Well, Europark Federation is the largest network in Europe, and normally there was a nice graphic here, but there's nothing to see on the screen, not so, so uh, important, but we, have, we are the largest network on nature uh, in Europe, more than 400 members in 36 countries, uh, and what are we doing as a Europark uh, Federation? I'm a councillor there, and Federico Menozzi on the opposite side of me, he is uh, working in the office in Brussels, uh, so we have a council, of course, and there is a directorate, one is in Regensburg in Germany. Uh, we exchange information and knowledge, we do a lot of projects and they are working uh, within sections. And together with the European Union and with the European Commission, we celebrated on the 20th anniversary of, of, of life in Natura 2000, just a month ago, in, uh, near my national park in Belgium. Uh, and there we decided, and also the graph is a little bit gone, but we decided that we would merger with Eurosite, uh, another big network in Europe, and become one network uh, in 2013. Of course, protected areas, as you uh, as mentioned a lot of times today, is very important to work with, uh, and Europe Park Federation is doing that with uh, transboundary parks, following a nature's design, a step by step, working to, together, collaborate uh, with. Uh, or drop uh, with, with uh, national parks or uh, boundless parks on both sides of, of, a, of a border. And at the moment, there are nine certifi uh, certi certified Europark transboundary parks uh, in, 19, in, in 11 countries. But parks are in Europe mostly living and cultural landscapes. And uh, very interesting tourism destinations. You have to know that a lot of people are trying to see when they go on holidays 
where there are a lot of uh, biodiversity hospitals and then decide there to go to. So that's an interesting uh, opportunity to work with that. So Europark worked out a European Charter for Sustainable Tourism in Protected Areas. That's a methodology working together because integration is a really big buzzword, not only a buzzword, but a really important uh, word because it was one of the conclusions of the CBD in Nagoya to be in, to work integrated together. And uh, Europark Federation does it and has now uh, chartered uh, in uh, 107 protected areas in 13, 13 European countries. So maybe you are thinking of becoming a member of Europark Federation. It's maybe a good idea to do so. Um, so you see that's a little bit more. Four million people are living in uh, those areas, you know, protected areas. Uh, there are 3,206 partner organizations, 73 million people visit uh, charter parks each year, and uh, 441 million euros are invested in charter parks, uh, charter protected areas, uh, to, com to accomplish their tourism actions. And we are dealing with several local products where, they, where people can buy them. This, this is what Europarks does, collaborating, exchanging knowledge in a very, very good way, in my opinion. And if you want to become part uh, of that, uh, next year the Europark Federation will uh, have its 40th anniversary and will be celebrated in Hortobaci National Park in Hungary. A little bit further to the regional landscape camp in the Maasl, Maasl is a Belgian uh, uh, NGO where I'm, that I'm running. Uh, and that's what I think also in Greece is, and in a lot of places in Europe is, is going on. We are finding local solutions for global problems. And we have to dissem disseminate these kind of uh, small but really, really sustainable solutions to the world, I think. What we did and now is communicate as a reconnection model is trying to reconnect society again with biodiversity and the beautiful landscapes. So with four uh, basic uh, uh, sentences, reconnect nature with nature, people with nature, business with biodiversity and policy with practice. This is the kind of, uh, let's say, uh, how we try to uh, evolve the society with uh, those beautiful things where we are coming from. So involving the citizens and local we are dealing and we are running a lot of uh, European projects from Interreg over uh, ERDF and so on and so forth. And not only at the national park is one of our projects, but also we are working as a transboundary park together with the Netherlands and so on and so forth. And now our model is also used for, uh, by IUCN and also by Europark Federation as an interesting example to work with. As we are a former coal mining region, the coal mines were closed down in 1990 uh, in Belgium. 40,000 people were unemployed, so it's very similar to here. A lot of uh, stories about what harsh times uh, we've come to, and also maybe people who follow the situation in Belgium now. The Ford car plant is also closed down, or will be closed down next year. Over 10,000 people were unemployed in, in my region. So what is the resilience of, uh, of a region? The Hogekampen National Park is very recently uh, developed as a national park. 2006 it was opened. Over 6,000 species still occur there, with a lot of the species which are on the rest red list, also on the European uh, red list. And the management of the national park is not done by my organization, but is done by the National Agency for Nature and Forest. But what it is all about, you see there, the the, the square, which is more or less the square of the national park, and then the circle around it, that's what it is all about. This national park is 6,000 hectares, but the, the, the project we are working on is 25,000 hectares. So we are reconnecting society into those uh, biodiversity goals together with our municipalities and so on and so forth. And we work nowadays, what we say, from NIMBY to PIMBY, from not in my backyard to please in my backyard. And it's working, at least in my region. And also big projects are going on there. Defragmentation, also the relocation, <coughs> industrial sites, which, which was decided uh, with, with the Belgian government. And it, of course, it has a time frame of 25 years to, to do so. But we have at least the decision, working with sustainable tourism, with local entrepreneurs, with rangers, all things what you can do in several uh, protected areas across Europe and also in, uh, we did it in in Belgium with the local gateways, which is telling the story of the National Park five times different. We work together with universities uh, to uh, 
see what the difference is or what the, what the implications are of, of climate change on biodiversity. And now you see another graph with no uh, figures on there. So but it, I think I have a little bit there. So what we see, because we are calculating electronically our visitors uh, who are hiking and staying and cycling in our national park, that's the good thing we did from the beginning. That's why we also are a case study in the deep uh, uh, reports. So what we see that the average amount of visitors after opening in 2006 is 725,000, an increase of 32%, and so on and so forth. You can read it for yourself, but directly uh, related to uh, the sustainable tourism, you see there are uh, there are direct revenues in that of 13 million euros a year, and if you calculate indirect revenues together, only on the sustainable tourism side, is 24 million euros, it's not on the screen. So the next step we did, and then I will conclude, the next step what we did is make made a deep uh, report uh, of the whole camp and national park, so not only looking into the sustainable uh, tourism, but also what is the national park related to the purification of water and air, what is the housing market doing, housing market doing and so on and so forth. Uh, and the conclusion over there, and that's of course we have to look into them and maybe that's good for the next presentation because uh, the, the, the overall uh, of the, uh, summary there is that there is an annual turnover directly and indirectly of 191 million euros a year. But please keep in mind also what uh, Patrick said that it's also about avoided costs uh, related to uh, drinking water and so on and so forth, but also 5,000 jobs are involved just in six municipalities uh, uh, related to one national park in Belgium. And then, and I will conclude, you have to disseminate your results and your new solutions. We can do it together, I think, and also then big uh, people out of the world like uh, El Gore is interested or Nancy Pelosi. Uh, what we are doing, and if also the European Commission, uh, we had not so long ago, uh, European Commissioner and the European President at my national park to give a sign to the world that was in 2010, just before the CBD got, got in uh, Nagoya. Uh, I think uh, if we work together and we uh, are exchanging knowledge all the time, I think we can make the deal. And Martin Luther King, as I said, never to start with, I had a nightmare, but I have a dream. So we have to make that dream together. So thank you very much.